speaker today is, is Kirby Ferguson, the man behind Everything is a Remix. And as I mentioned in the opening remarks, Everything is a Remix is this fantastic fantastic series of videos that really explain how culture builds on culture. And I love Everything is a Remix for a number of professional reasons, but I think the reason I love Everything is a Remix the most is for a personal reason. And that's because working at public knowledge, it's really hard sometimes to explain to people what I do at cocktail parties or when I visit family members, they just they don't get what's going on. And everything is a remix of something that I can, I can give somebody, say, watch these videos, I explain this to Congress all day. This is what I'm trying to make them understand. So there are professional reasons I love, but as a, as a personal way to get through the explanation of what goes on, I say, Kirby, thank you so much for these videos. Please join me in welcoming Kirby first. Good work you guys do. Uh, between 2010 and uh, 2012, late 2010 and recently in 2012, I was working on a series called Everything's Remix. It was a four-part video series that I distributed for free on the web. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you can check it out. Just Google it and you'll find it. Uh, four parts, about 10 to 15 minutes each. First one was about music. Started with music, went into film the second one. Innovation in the third one, which is a lot of what I'll talk about here today. And the fourth one, I got into uh, the law, and that one came out just a couple of months ago. So rather than uh, over explain the premise, I think I'll just uh, play a little clip from the beginning of part one. Remix to combine or edit existing materials to produce something new. The term remix originally applied to music. It rose to prominence late last century during the heyday of hip hop, the first popular music form to incorporate sampling from existing recordings. Early example, Sugar Hill Gang samples the bass riff from Sheets and Good Times in the 1979 hit Rapper's Delight. Since then, that same bass line has been sampled dozens of times. and anybody can remix anything. Music, video, photos, whatever, and distribute it globally pretty much instantly. You don't need expensive tools, you don't need a distributor, you don't even need skills. Remixing is a folk art. Anybody can do it. Yet these techniques, collecting material, combining it, transforming it, are the same ones used at any level of creation. You could even say that everything is a remix. Alright, so, uh, remix. What does this mean? Remix is simply making new stuff out of old stuff. Forget the technical jargon, but that's the <laughs> basic idea. Making new stuff out of old stuff. So you take a couple of previously existing songs, you slice them up, you put them together, you make something new, but the pieces of the old things are still recognizable in the new thing. Those little chunks are called samples. So remixing could be thought of as the arrangement and transformation of samples, but I think remix is a good metaphor for any kind of creation. So copying elements, combining them, transforming them, that for me is the basics of anything, any kind of creative idea. Now this is in opposition to our myths of creativity. Uh, as a culture, we don't really have realistic ideas about how creativity actually happens. What we have is myths, we have stories, and they're good stories, but I think they fundamentally send us down the wrong path. Touched by the hand of God, this is, uh, for most of human history, what we consider creativity to be. Uh, humans weren't considered powerful enough to actually create something themselves. They were channeling the beauty of God, the beauty of nature. And uh, we still, you know, have remnants of this idea now. Not that we think, you know, creativity, creativity is divine, but it's some sort of an elevated, mystical accomplishment that is greater than other sorts of activities. 
A couple hundred years ago, the Romantics came along. Beethoven is an early example. And the Romantics were, in many ways, kind of a, an opposite reaction to this very confining role that artists had had before this. Uh, they claimed inspirations as their own, as the expression of their own unique voices. And this is an idea that has also stuck. A uh, real genius is the lone creator who bucks tradition, who goes his own way, and does his own thing. Our culture likes this idea of a singular genius. We like the idea of a singular anything. You know, if you did it on your own without anybody else, we really like that, even though we know you really didn't. <laughs> light bulb, how could I talk about creativity in a presentation without showing a light bulb? So there's the light bulb. <laughs> Box tick, it's done. Uh, this is our most popular visualization, visualization of an idea. So, uh, you know, it's a metaphor for how it happens. It happens fast, it happens out of black. Uh, first there was darkness, and then there was light. It happens fast. Uh, and of course, this isn't a realistic uh, uh, idea of how creativity actually happens. It's a sprawling, messy affair with a lot of, usually a lot of small insights along the way. Lady Mazel d'Avion, famous painting by Pablo Picasso. Uh, nothing like this had been seen before this was painted. Uh, so, you know, this, is, this sort of thing is still kind of gold standard. Uh, great creators break the mold and create something unprecedented, something revolutionary. But of course, this was drawn from the influences of its time. So African art, classical sculpture, its contemporaries, Picasso coaxed this creation out of his culture at this particular moment in time. Okay, so those who miss what's the reality? How do we actually create? There are three basic elements. First thing you need is uh, domain knowledge. You need to be grounded in the language of your field. So how do you get domain knowledge? Copy, flat out, emulation. Uh, you can't contribute worthwhile new works until you've internalized the knowledge and the techniques of your medium. Uh, so in order to create for culture, to communicate with it, you need to speak the language. You need to speak like everybody else speaks. And you learn to speak by speaking like everybody else speaks. You don't start doing your own thing right away. You just learn the words, learn grammar, and uh, talk like everybody else does. You can see this in the career of any artist. So Bob Dylan, for instance, uh, his first song contained 11 cover songs, almost the entire album was cover songs. And early in his career, he mostly seemed intent on being Woody Guthrie, who was the previous generation's uh, folk icon. So it didn't, it didn't seem like he was intent on being the next to Woody Guthrie, he just you know, wanted to be Woody Guthrie. He was doing his very best to be as much like Woody Guthrie as possible. Richard Pryor, uh, influential stand-up comic from the 70s, introduced topics like race, sex, drug abuse, uh, just the stuff from his life into comedy, which, with a couple exceptions, was mostly a fairly shallow field of expression. Uh, but he began his career doing a not very good imitation of Bill Cosby. So if you watch Pryor's early stuff, he's really doing like a second-rate Bill Cosby imitation. <laughs> Hunter S. Thompson uh, invented gonzo journalism, so took the novelistic first-person uh, first uh, viewpoint Combine that with journalism, acknowledge that journalism uh, is subjective, can't be objective. Uh, but before he did that, he was working as a straight journalist. And in his spare time, he actually retyped books, a couple of books. He retyped re um, Great Gatsby and Farrell with Arms, just word for word, sat down, retyped the whole thing, just to get the feel of writing a great novel. So once you are grounded in your domain, it's impossible to create something new through Transformation. So, taking an idea and creating variations. So, using logic, intuition, streamlining, expanding, inverting, uh, making mistakes has a lot of value as a creative technique. It's very time consuming stuff, but if you do enough of it, you can potentially produce a breakthrough. James Watt, for instance, uh, created a major improvement to the steam engine because he was assigned to repair a Thomas Newcomen steam, steam engine. So it wasn't like he you know, was making tea one day and thought, hey, it'd be great if we could use that for mining or whatever. Uh, you know, he was, he was a kid. He was assigned to fix an engine that already existed. Uh, and he spent 12 years fiddling with that design to get it right. Christopher Lathan Scholes. Uh, modeled his typewriter keyboard layout on a piano. Uh, early on, typewriters were commonly referred to as literary pianos, which I think is just a lovely phrase that I wish we signed that you agree with me. I wish we still use that, it's lovely. Uh, but this piano-like uh, design slowly evolved over five years into the QWERTY keyboard layout, which we still use for better, of course, now. 
uh, Thomas Edison, uh, of course, didn't invent the light bulb. His first patent application was actually turned down. It was considered an infringement. Uh, his second one was called, uh, which was ultimately approved and was the, the, the pivotal light bulb, uh, was called Improvements in Electric Lamps. It wasn't called the electric lamp. It was an improvement on an existing invention. Uh, so specifically, he produced the first commercially viable bulb. That was his accomplishment. It wasn't actually inventing the light bulb. Uh, he and his team did this by trying 6,000 different materials for the filament. So again, this is all very time consuming stuff. It takes place over the course of years. So these are all major advances, but they're not exactly original creations. So uh, they're more like tipping points in a continuous line of invention by a lot of different people. So steam engines, typewriters, light bulbs, uh, these had already existed before this. These particular ones were the versions that triggered major historical shifts. Now it's with combinations that we frequently see uh, dramatic creative leaps. Uh, by connecting ideas together, especially when they don't seem to be related, uh, this can produce radical innovation, what business people would call disruptive innovation. Uh, Albert Einstein discovered the formula E equals mc squared, but of course he did discover energy and mass at the speed of light. He discovered that they fit together in a surprisingly elegant and simple way. Johann Gutenberg's printing press, this was invented around 1450, but the components, movable type, paper, ink, these have been around for centuries in Rome and in China. Uh, pivotal, oops, sorry, pivotal element here is the screw press, which is what this guy is cranking on here, because it had nothing to do with printing. It was used in, uh, for food production, for, making, for, for squeezing things to get juice or oil out of it, like wine, olive oil. It was used for that, so it's a technology that had nothing to do with printing. Uh, that was the, you know, the hidden element that brought it all together. So that's a common source of radical invention, integrating something from a foreign field into your field. Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the uh, World Wide Web. World Wide Web is kind of the uh, ultimate combination technology. It's a hypertext layer for the internet, which is a network of networks. Uh, it's a bunch of protocols that manage to speak to each other because they speak uh, in, in open protocols. They all speak the same language. Uh, and Berners-Lee didn't even have to invent hypertext. Hypertext has already been invented. Nerds knew all about it. You can see it in... Uh, Douglas Engelbart's uh, technology demonstrations from the late 60s. Hypertext had been around a long time, so it was his fusion of these things, and they were distributed openly that uh, you know came to the web. So those are the three basic elements of creativity: copy, transform, and combine. Uh, you can see all of these at work in the arts plenty, especially as we all become more and more media saturated. I think we see it more and more commonly, and so we can actually take the stuff, the actual media, and slice it up to do things with it, which is you know, a fairly new thing. Uh, super common now, but it's been around a long time. Uh, and a good example from the 70s, I think, is the film Star Wars, which I nerded out on mm -hmm. in part two of everything that's remix. So George Lucas was a uh, big, big film nerd, uh, and his influences found their way into his work, sometimes in very recognizable fashion. So here's a clip this is from part two of everything's remix. Even now, Star Wars endures as a work of impressive imagination, but many of its individual components are as recognizable as the samples in a remix. The foundation for Star Wars comes from Joseph Campbell. He popularized the structures of myth in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Star Wars follows the outline of the monomyth, which consists of stages like the Call to Adventure, Supernatural Aid, the Belly of the Whale, the Road of Trials, the Meeting with the Goddess, and a bunch more. Also huge influences were the Flash Gordon serials from the 30s and Japanese director Akira Kurosawa. Star Wars plays much like an updated version of Flash Gordon, right down to the soft wipes and the opening titles design. From Kurosawa, we get Masters of Spiritual Martial Arts, a low-ranking bickering duo, more soft wipes, a Beneath the Floorboards hideaway, and a boastful baddie getting his arm chopped off. Just watch yourself. We want it big. I have the descendants on 12 systems. <laughs> War films and westerns were also huge sources for Star Wars. The scene where Luke discovers his slaughtered family resembles this scene from The Searchers. And the 
scene where Han Solo shoots Greedo resembles this scene from The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. The climactic airstrikes in the Dam Busters, 633 Squadron, and the bridges at Toko Reef play very similarly to the run in the Death Star. And in many cases, existing shots were even used as templates for Star Wars special effects. There's also many other elements clearly derived from various films. We have a tin man like a tin woman in Metropolis, a couple shots inspired by 2001, a grab the girl and swing scene like this one in The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, a holographic projection kind of like the one in Forbidden Planet, a rally resembling this one in Triumph of the Will, and cute little robots much like those in Silent Running. So this notion that we are remixing the work of others has plenty of implications on our ideas about originality, which are now inter intertwined with ideas of property. Uh, ideas are considered property, legally, morally. Uh, this is understandable to a degree. It was like, I think Katie was saying it earlier, it, it's visceral. You know, when you spent years working on something, you've uh, endured countless setbacks, failures, uh, you've worked on it for a, for a very long time. It feels in your gut like it's you know, like it's yours. You're so familiar with it. It feels like it's yours, but uh, you know it, it just isn't. Not completely. Um, you know we all take ideas from others. Lots of them. It's mostly what we do, but this tends to not register because of our nature. Humans are more sensitive to losses than to gains. Uh, behavioral economists refer to this as loss aversion. Uh, our minds are predisposed towards not losing what we had. Probably some sort of an evolutionary thing, you know, the proto-humans who could keep track of where the bananas were, could, you know, prosper and multiply, and the ones who lost them probably died. <laughs> uh, so when we're taking from each other, uh, from our culture, from our domain, that doesn't register. Uh, but once we have something of our own that we feel is worth taking, we tend to get possessive. A couple of ideas distorting our view here. First one is this idea of individualistic creation, the romantic idea of the lone creator. This is an idea that's already in decline from my perspective. Uh, I think a lot of people who do creative work don't think in this way anymore. But it's still a dominant idea in the culture. We think highly successful creators are extraordinary and highly original. So it's an idea that I, I feel is in decline, but uh, with this project I'm kind of trying to pound another nail in the coffin. Ideas of property, this is you know, not in decline at this moment. I'm hoping that if maybe that first domino falls, that this one might also fall, at least partially. Uh, so this is a, a doozy. This is ingrained in our system of commerce. Uh, but it's a fairly recent idea. It's modern. Uh, and it's misleading, of course. Ideas aren't property. They aren't matter. You can't literally take someone's idea. All you can do is copy it, in which case they still have the idea. Uh, so that's different, and I think it's important that we Acknowledge that difference because it, it sends you down a completely different path with how you conceive of this stuff. So the metaphor of property for ideas is clearly inaccurate and I think it causes trouble in our culture. Because ideas contain other ideas, that's how they are built. Uh, we build our new ideas out of the old ones. So ownership of ideas is uh, complicated just to, to begin with, even in, in its minimal form, it's very complicated. But it gets impossibly complicated uh, when we try to cordon off our little creations uh, and keep, uh, keep others out uh, and, and delay claim to you know, our little plot of creative land. Um, because if you look closely, our works contain other people's works. This applies to everybody. Another demonstration of that, this is from part three of Everything is Remix. Uh, it shows how Apple built on previous technology, most notably that of Xerox. Eventually, Apple got a load of the Alto and later released not one, but two computers with graphical interfaces, the Lisa and its more successful follow-up, the Macintosh. The Alto was never a commercial product, but Xerox did release a system based on it in 1981, the Star 8010. Two years before the Lisa, three years before the Mac. It was the star in the Alto that served as the foundation for the Macintosh. The Xerox star used a desktop metaphor with icons for documents and folders. It had a pointer, scroll bars, and pop-up menus. These were huge innovations and the Mac copied every one of them. But it was the first combination incorporated that set the Mac on a path towards long-term success. 
Apple aimed to merge the computer with the household appliance. The Mac was to be a simple device, like a TV or a stereo. This was unlike the Star, which was intended for professional use and vastly different from the cumbersome command-based systems that dominated the app. The Mac was for the home, and this produced a cascade of transformations. Firstly, Apple removed one of the buttons on the mouse to make its novel pointing device less confusing. Then they added the double click for opening files. The Star used a separate key to open files. The Mac also let you drag icons around and move and resize windows. The Star didn't have drag and drop. You moved and copied files by selecting an icon, pressing a key, then clicking the location. And you resized windows with a menu. The Star and the Alto both featured pop-up menus, but because the location of these would move around the screen, the user had to continually reorient. The Mac introduced the menu bar, which stayed in the same place no matter what you were doing. And the Mac added the trash can to make deleting files more intuitive and less nerve-wracking. And lastly, through compromise and clever engineering, Apple managed to pare the Mac's price down to $2,500. Still pretty expensive, but much cheaper than the $10,000 Lisa or the $17,000 Star. But what started it all was the graphical interface merged with the idea of the computer as household appliance. The Mac as a demonstration of the explosive potential of combinations. The Star and the Alto, on the other hand, are the products of years of elite research and development. They are a testament to the slow power of transformation. But of course, they too contain the work of others. The Alto and the Star are evolutionary branches that lead back to the MLS system, which introduced Windows and the mouse, to Sketchpad, the first interactive drawing application, and even back to the Memex, a concept resembling the modern PC decades before it was possible. So you can see hypertext actually at work in that split screen shot there, uh, which is from the late 60s. There, there was hypertext, you know, uh, 15 years before the web. I'll close with a uh, quote. This is kind of at the heart of what I'm trying to do. Uh, by idolizing those whom we honor, we do a disservice both to them and to ourselves. We fail to recognize that we could go and do likewise. Charles B. Billy is a sociologist at uh, Harvard. This is kind of, um, this is what it's all about for me. Um, I'm not trying to diminish the accomplishments of any of the people that, that I talk about, uh, but I am trying to show that it's not magic, it's work, and anyone who produces a, a cute little remix video and uploads it to YouTube, you're dipping a toe in the same pool as, as all of these guys. I mean, it's very primitive what you're doing, it's incredibly early, but those basic techniques, if you just keep using those, who knows what you can accomplish. That's it. Thanks so much. You mentioned at the uh, beginning of your talk that you made these videos for free, and I, I was wondering, and uh, we always hear that, that copyright is sort of this necessary incentive so that people can get paid for doing sure. creative things, but you obviously, uh, that wasn't at the core of why you did what you did, and I wonder if you might sure. talk a little bit about that. Yeah, cool. Uh, I had a job at first, uh, so it was a part-time thing. I thought it would be easy when I started it, because, um, you know, normally I, I shoot things, uh, so I thought, you know, hey, I don't have to shoot stuff. This is going to be a free. So I'm going to just like throw this together in my day's spare time. And then, of course, it, you know, it took forever. It took an incredibly long time to do. But right away, it um, did really well. did a lot better than, than I thought it was going to do. So I stuck at the job for, I don't know, another six months or something like that. I put, put up the second part of it. And then uh, at that point, it was obvious through, you know, doing speaking stuff and, and commissions and sponsorships ended up coming up that uh, merchandise and I, I sold some t-shirts and some posters and stuff like that, that by putting all this stuff together, I could uh, make a living, you know, as much money as, as I was making at my job. So that's the route that I want to go down with, um, with the work that I do, and it's what I'll be doing with the next thing. You know, the media's free, it'll be even freer than this one because it'll be, you know, original stuff. Um, within uh, copyright law, this one is, is gray, I think, some of it. Um, so people can take it and they can rechop it and you know uh, do whatever they want with it. They can sell it, whatever. After it's out of you know after it's released, it's not my concern what happens to it. So you know I, I think you know the, the media is a great way to get attention. And then if you have 
some, some things outside of that that, that can uh, generate income from your, your hardcore people, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can make a living. You gotta keep it small, I think, you know, that, that's important too. So you're talking about, uh, I guess, all of the, the ways in which any increased house has tons of influences. Uh, what do you think about sort of the state of the law? What, you know, what should or what does the law, what does the law do or what should it do? to right. account for it, you know, it's not this slow fire genius model. Right. I mean, I think, I think we basically had it right um, when it started. You know, it was basically just a way to keep people from getting ripped off. Like there's a famous case with um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which got translated into German, I think it was. And, uh, you know, the publishers ensued, uh, and they lost because, you know, the idea was that's a fair use. There, you know, now German people can read the book and they couldn't before. So it was very, very confined. And I think that's all it has to do. I think you know, a little protection goes a long way. And uh, once you go beyond that, then you get into gray areas where people are not just blatantly ripping you off. And uh, you end up losing expression that way. So I think you, know, you just want to get rid of the scumbags, basically. You want to target them. And then, and then outside of that, you're going to have like, loads of Hack work, loads of derivative stuff, loads of bad art, and that just comes to the turf. I think that's part of it, and that's fine. It's good. Sorry. So, so, you're, so you're distinguishing between the bad guys and the hacks. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's a difference between this stuff that is intended, especially if you're trying to make money with it. Uh, it's piracy. Uh, I think that distinguishes you up between a different league. Uh, but yeah, I think if you have any kind of creative intent with it, even if it's meager, uh, which is what most stuff is. Pretty meager, you know. People just put a little twist on it, and, and they feel like they've done something with it. Uh, I think that's fine. You know, I think that's just um, you know, take a good with bad. You're gonna get a lot of the bad, and I think that's just the way it goes. The way to embrace it. Anybody else? Michael? Swami? No. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, could you stand at the mic, please? licensing like creative commons mm -hmm. figure into your yeah. creative commons is interesting. I mean it's I you know I mean I'd much rather see the laws change. I mean I think that's what really that's what I'd love to see happen. I love creative commons. Um, but like once you're in that world, you're in that world, you know you can't really mix and match between them. So that's my problem with it. That's why I didn't create a Commons license this, because it's not, you know, a lot of stuff in it is not actually mine. So I felt like I, I couldn't. Though at the same time, I acknowledged, you know, if you want to do something, go ahead, I don't care. Um, so I think Creative Commons is great as an alternative. Um, but it, it seems like, I think it's established at this point that it's kind of a niche. Like, I, I'm not sure that it's ever going to um, you know, be that broadly successful. Um, but I love it. I love that it's there, that it gives people the choice. I'm going to use it for my next project. Um, so, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Yes. So, has anyone ever come after you for using clips? No, never. It doesn't happen. No. no. The only stuff that I think would be where someone could get a toehold is the, the music, the way I use the music. I think that's not actually. Or use probably, I think. Yeah, I can't. So I didn't say just five. Oh, sure. Yeah, right. Yeah, like George Lucas just doesn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it hasn't happened. Yeah. I, I think, you know, that I do, it is educational in intent. I, I think that helps a lot. Um, and a lot of it is, I think, is pretty clear in various, like the stuff that I do with, with Apple stuff and with Led Zeppelin is in the first one and uh, um, George Lucas' the Star, the Star Wars clips. You know, that's all demonstrably. Very clearly, very used. So uh, uh, I think I'm not a good target in, in a lot of ways. Anyone else? We're good. All right. Thanks so much.